And probably the biggest advantage of it is it can be reversed. So say you're taking this warfarin, this blood thinner from the atrial fibrillation, and you have some type of trauma where you get injured. We can rapidly reverse the blood thinning effects of the medication. Well, what are the disadvantages? Well, if anyone here has taken Coumadin or knows someone that takes Coumadin, there are certainly a lot of disadvantages to it. The first is that there's no steady state dosing. So I can't just say it's five milligrams every night. You have to fluctuate the dose to maintain the blood thinning levels within a certain range. And sometimes that can be very hard to do and people can't get in that range or stay in that range. There's frequent blood testing. The only way you know that the dose is right is you gotta get your blood tested. So sometimes that can be twice a week until you get the, uh, the regimen stable. It interacts with all kinds of medications. So if you're on warfarin, every time you start a new medicine, you've got to call the doctor and let them know to see if that could interact with the blood levels. And it also interacts with food. Particularly, everything I'm trying to tell you to eat as a cardiologist, the green leafy vegetables, the healthy diet, anything that contains vitamin K can negatively affect the cumin. So is there a better option? And the answer to me is clearly yes. There have been three medications which have come out over the last couple of years which have been designed to reduce the risk of stroke and atrial fibrillation without the side effects of warfarin. The first was Pradaxa. The next one to come along was Zarelto. And most recently, Eliquis has come into clinical practice. But what's unfortunate to me is I'm sure most of your knowledge of these medications is the garbage you see on TV every night. It seems like I can't even watch the news or anything without four or five Zarelto ads coming on TV. In fact, I just walked by the TV in our office and it was on when I was leaving. And I don't think that's fair, okay? I don't think that's an accurate depiction to you as the public as to what these medications can do. So let's talk about it. What are the benefits of these medicines? What are the disadvantages? Well, the advantages are these actually have a lower rate of mortality in comparison to Coumadin because there's a much lower risk of bleeding in your brain with these medicines as there is to Coumadin. If you get too much Coumadin, for every level that your blood goes above a certain range, you start to incrementally increase your risk of bleeding in the brain. And these medicines eliminate that because they maintain you in a constant blood thinning level. You don't have to get lab tests. There's no testing. You just take it. It's a one-size-fits dose for most people. Now, some of them have to be dosed based on your kidney function, but you basically either take a pill once a day or you take a pill twice a day. There's no blood testing that needs to be done with this. And that's a big deal for a lot of people that have had to go through repetitive blood tests. And it's a big deal for the people that are always getting their blood tested because they can't keep those Coumadin levels in a steady range. And it doesn't get affected by diet. So if you're a kale lover, if you're a spinach salad lover, whatever it is, it doesn't affect it like they can with Coumadin. Well, what are the disadvantages to the medicine? Well, we can't use it in certain conditions. It hasn't been studied. So if you have a prosthetic heart valve, I can't use it. Can't use it in pregnancy. Sometimes if you have really bad kidney disease, we can't use the medication. If you don't take it, it doesn't work. So if you miss a dose, the medicine's not working. So you have to be compliant with the medication. Not like Coumadin, where if you may miss a dose, you have a window in there where the medicine is still working. My experience with these medicines is that there is an increased risk of bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract as comparison to Coumadin. And I have seen that with Pradaxa, I have seen that with Zarelto, not as much with Eloquis. They're expensive, so a lot of insurance plans will not cover these medications as a tier one. And I've had a number of people who I've tried to put these on that simply can't afford the medicine, and Coumadin becomes the best option. You can't reverse them. All right. Now, I think they're pretty close to developing an antidote of reversal of Pradaxa, but if you get an injury on these medications, motor vehicle accident, whatever, you bleed until the medication's done doing its effect. Okay. And, that's, and that is a major downside to these medications. <coughs> All right, so that's blood thinning and atrial fibrillation. Comparison of what we used, which was warfarin, and the evolution now into these newer oral anticoagulant therapies. So at least now when you see the class action lawsuits, you'll have a better understanding of these are the pros and cons of those medications. Now I want to shift gears into cholesterol. I get more grief about statins than any other medication I prescribe hands down. 
I will talk to someone about some potentially life-threatening antiarrhythmic I need to put them on, and I get no problems. As soon as I bring up a statin, it's like everyone's face goes white. And again, I think that's due to a lot of negative publicity regarding these medications. What we know is that cholesterol is directly involved in a process of atherosclerosis or plaque formation in arteries. And we know that people who are at the highest risk, if we place them on these statin medications, we can reduce their chance of having a heart attack or stroke by 40%. Now, is there a pendulum of statin therapy? Of course. Many years ago, all of us said it should be in the water and everyone should take a statin. Well, that's probably not the case. And the American Heart Association has now developed guidelines for determining who should be on a statin and who shouldn't. But I will leave you with this point that if you've had a heart attack, you've had a stroke, you have peripheral vascular disease, there is overwhelming clinical evidence to be on the statin medication. Sometimes the statins just don't work. Okay, so even though we put you on the right dose of the statin medication, we can't reduce your cholesterol to where it needs to be. And sometimes people get side effects from it. The most common side effect is musculoskeletal, joint aches, muscle aches. I've had people say they get charley horses, all kinds of weird musculoskeletal stuff. Uh, that occurs in about 5 to 10% of the people that take it. They used to get worried about liver function test abnormalities, inflammation of the liver. That occurs so infrequently that there's more of a harm now of getting a blood test than having a liver injury, so we don't even check that. There's all kinds of floating things out there. Does it cause Alzheimer's? Does it affect your short-term memory? None of that has been clinically proven. I will tell you, in my practice, I have seen three or four people who I've had on high-dose Lipitor who have developed short-term memory loss, and when I have stopped the medication, those symptoms have resolved. But that's just my own clinical experience. So what about the people that can't take the statins? What if you're one of those that it drives your muscles crazy? You've had a heart attack, you've got some stents in there, you can't take the statins, and you're worried about it. Well, we don't, we don't really have good alternatives. There's other medicines called Zetia, there's medicines called Niacin, there's these medicines called the fibric acids, but none of them have been shown to have the same risk reduction as the statin medications. So what they have developed now is, is really fascinating. You always kind of wonder how these people come up with this, but it's called the PCK2S9 inhibitor. So up on the slide, I put a liver cell. Uh, so these are cells inside your liver, and these cells have little receptors on the outside of them that receive the bad cholesterol, or the LDL. So you see the little LDLR, which is the receptor. So what happens normally is the cholesterol will bind to that receptor and then get incorporated into the cell where it's broken down. And then the receptor sort of circulates back up to the surface of the cell to pick up another <coughs> cholesterol molecule. Well, what they found is there's a little protein, this PCK, PCSK9 protein, that can bind to those receptors. And when they go into the cell, both the cholesterol molecule and the receptor get degraded. So you lose that receptor, and it decreases the number of receptors that can go back up to the cell, sur to the cell surface to pick up more molecules. So they have developed an antibody to that PCSK9 molecule to break it down so it allow more receptors to come back up to the cell surface, pull more of the LDL bad cholesterol out of your body. There are two companies, Amgen is one of them, that is making these medications. The one that we have the most experience with is Repatha, which I got to admit is, is a new medication. We have like four, three, four people now that we've tried to prescribe it to. The medicine comes as a self-injection, so it's not a pill. It is a, um, actually have one here. It's like, a, like an insulin. And the medicine comes preloaded. It's a standard dose, sits in your refrigerator. You take it off, load it in, put it on the arm, and you click, and it infuses that antibody medication into your arm. It is a self-injection that is supposed to be given every two weeks. Well, how do we know what it does? Well, we know that if you can take a little statin, but you can't get enough statin to get your cholesterol where it needs to be, if we add the Repatha on top of that, we can reduce your LDL, your bad cholesterol, by an additional 77%. And we know the more you reduce your LDL cholesterol, the lower is your risk of heart attack or stroke. We also found 
that using some form of a statin, whatever the patient can tolerate, and this repatha, we can get people's cholesterol over 90% of the time to go therapy. There are only a couple patient populations at this point that are approved for the medicine. The first is if you have some type of atherosclerotic disease, heart attack, stroke, peripheral vascular disease, whatever, and the statins aren't effective, and there's some gray zone in there. Maybe you can't tolerate a statin, so therefore the statin's not effective. Or maybe you can only tolerate a low dose and it's not effective. Whatever the case is, that's one patient population this is indicated for. The other is people that have familial problems with their cholesterol, some genetic pattern of passed down abnormalities in cholesterol metabolism. Well, what are the side effects? I mean, everyone's concerned about the side effects of the statins. What are the side effects of this medicine? Well, they're really pretty benign so far. The most published side effect, which occurs in about 10% of the people, is an upper respiratory infection. Kind of flu, you know, cold, runny nose, sore throat. Uh, the muscle aches, the joint aches, the potential for liver injury. The, it doesn't cause Alzheimer's, doesn't cause cancer. None of that has been found with this medication so far. Well, what are the downsides? Well, it's a new medicine and we need more outcome data. I think the important thing when you take any medication is, forget about the numbers. Who cares if your cholesterol goes from 200 to 150? Just taking that medicine every day reduce your chance of having a heart attack, stroke, or dying from cardiovascular disease, and the ongoing clinical trials to start published yet for this medication. All right, so I'm gonna break off the medications there. New treatments for atrial fibrillation, the evolving therapies for treating cholesterol when statins don't work. Well, let's talk about a little bit how, about how things have been advancing in our cardiac catheterization lab. One of the, this is a diagram of your heart here, and what I've illustrated in the middle is called your aortic valve. The aortic valve is very important because it separates your left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of your heart, from your aorta, which is the main blood vessel. And its function is, when the heart squeezes the blood forward, it opens up to let all the blood out. And then when the heart's done squeezing, it closes shut to prevent the blood from leaking back into the left ventricle. So you can see here on the top, when the heart opens, the valve leaflets open, and when it's done contracting, the leaflets should <coughs> close, sort of similar to a Mercedes-Benz sign. But you can have all kinds of problems with your aortic valve. And one of the most common conditions that we see with the aortic valve is a condition called aortic stenosis. So as you age, particularly if you've had a history of high blood pressure, and you've had high cholesterol, and you've had sort of this chronic damage and irritation to the heart valve structure, it can start to build calcium. You get little calcium nodules that build up on the valve. And as those nodules continue to build and continue to build, they start to deform the valve and prevent it from opening. And that condition is called aortic stenosis or aortic narrowing. And it can produce a lot of problems in people. As it gets to be severely narrowed, you can get shorter breaths with activity. You can feel lightheaded and dizzy with activity. And you can get chest pain, not because it's an artery problem, but because when you walk, the heart's got to pump so hard to get blood through that narrow valve that you can't get enough blood and oxygen to the heart muscle. So when it becomes severely narrowed, and when you develop symptoms from it, what do we do about it? Well, we replace it. And to this point, the mainstay of therapy has been surgical replacement of the valve. So, open heart surgery. You make an incision down the midline of the chest, the sternum is sawed open, the chest cavity is cracked open, and the heart sac is opened, the aorta is exposed, the bad valve is cut out, and the new valve is put in. And there's mainly two types of valves that we use. Sometimes we use the mechanical valves, and sometimes we use the tissue valves, depending on which patient we're operating. Well, no one wants to go through this. No one I tell you got to have aortic valve surgery is like, oh, that sounds great. It's, you know, it's, it's a hard procedure to go through. And there's a lot of morbidity and mortality that can be associated with these procedures. It's a long recovery. It can be four to six weeks after surgery before you're back up on your feet feeling sort of normal again. And sometimes people are just too high risk. So maybe, you know, since this is a disease of <coughs> individuals, sometimes they already have organs that are dysfunctional. So they got chronic kidney disease. Their kidneys don't work as well because the blood pressure and the cholesterol has affected the kidneys. 
And we always worry about that when we put them on cardiopulmonary bypass. Is that going to cause more damage to the kidneys? A lot of times this occurs in smokers. So they may have some COPD or underlying lung disease, which will affect how long they're on a ventilator for the surgery. Sometimes they have associated neurological disease. They've already had a stroke. They've got an occluded carotid artery. And we're putting them on bypass and affecting blood flow. And sometimes people are just, they're just too old, too frail to go through a surgery like that. It's too demanding on your body. <clears throat> sometimes people, we have technical limitations. So we can't open the aorta because there's so much calcium. They call that a porcelain aorta that's built up there that you can't cut into it. It's just too thick. It's like a calcified pipe. They define people as high risk is if your surgical risk, if your risk of dying during the operation in the hospital is over 15%. Then they say you're too high risk for this operation and they won't go. So what happens to those people? Do you just send them out to the field, say good luck, you're gonna die, you know, let me know what I can do. And up until recently, the answer was just sort of yes. And and dying from this valve is it's like drowning in your own fluid. You die of congestive heart failure. So they have now developed ways to replace this valve without surgery. And it's called trans transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or most of us call it TAVR for short. So what happens is it, it's sort of replaced like an angiogram. I'll try to illustrate up here and see if you can see back there. But for any of you guys that have had angiograms, you know what we do is we put an IV into what we call the femoral artery, which is sort of right here in the groin. And we put a sheath in there, which is sort of a big IV that we can access. And we put a special catheter in, which then goes up through the femoral artery into the aorta, wraps up and around the heart, and to where the valve is positioned in the area of the narrow valve. And these valves, that you have two types, they have ones that you balloon expand or that self-expand, are then inflated in the area where the diseased valve is, giving you a new valve. So no longer are you requiring open heart surgery. No longer do you have the morbidity and mortality associated with the open heart surgery. You have an access site to your femoral artery. You have a new valve that is positioned and you're, and you're cured. Now, this doesn't qualify, everyone's not qualified for this. They continue to expand the indications for this. Surgical repair or replacement of your aortic valve is still the gold standard. But this continues to evolve. They continue to progress in terms of who can qualify for this procedure. They're now doing it for people that have bad heart valves. So say you had a surgical valve replaced before and it's starting to leak. They're finding ways to put these valves inside your replaced valve. And my guess is within the next five to 10 years, very few people will have open heart surgery to replace their aortic valve. And this will be the mainstay of therapy. We used to only have one valve that we could use and the limitations was how big the artery was, because sometimes these people have such bad vascular disease and you have a narrow little diseased artery that you just you can't get a big enough IV in there to get up there. So there were a lot of vascular complications. So then they developed ways, we called it the valve on a stick, because they could puncture a, a, do a thoracotomy here and go up through the apex of the ventricle, sort of anagrade going forward up there in the blood. This is called the retrograde technique. And now that they have a series of different valve sizes, has become the gold standard. One of my colleagues that I trained with at Scripps now works down at UC Davis and has done this procedure on a number of our patients and they've done fantastic. Okay. Them just great. And they were too sick. They couldn't have open heart surgery. So when you, when you have this disease, this valve, it's not like I just pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, are you free on Friday? Can you put this new valve in? It's a, it's a very complex decision, so you meet with nursing, you meet with a cardiothoracic surgeon, you meet with an interventional cardiologist. So there's whole teams of people that evaluate these people to make sure they're appropriate candidates. The major downside of these valves is if you don't seat it right and it leaks, that's a bad outcome. Okay, so you've got to get the valve, you've got to get the right size, and you've got to get it seated in there perfectly. But when it works, it's perfect. Okay. Last topic I want to talk about, and this is, this is really exciting, and this is the era of digital medicine. And when I was sort of preparing this talk, I thought, what is digital medicine? That's kind of a weird term. And digital medicine is really just sort of the fusion 
of all of the advancements that we're making in technology with healthcare. And when I was training in San Diego, this was a huge field that was evolving. Partnerships between Qualcomm and Scripps and trying to combine all this genomic information that we're gathering, all this new technology with non-invasive monitoring to figure out how we can make healthcare better. Well, how do we make healthcare better? Better? Well, we involve you. I mean, a lot of this digital medicine now involves you as a patient, so you're directly involved in your healthcare, which makes you understand it more, to be willing to take the medicines more, to have a bigger role in it. It's just not just coming in to see me and say, take this pill, take this pill, take this pill, and this pill, and you leave feeling depressed because you feel like something's wrong with you. It brings you in and involved into the environment. It reduces our inefficiencies. We get better monitoring. We have more surveillance data. We get you involved so we can provide a more efficient care of medicine. It makes it cost less. When we're more efficient, it costs less, and that's always going to be an issue in medicine moving forward is how do we reduce healthcare costs? Like I said, we make medicine more personalized. It goes from a blanket statement of everyone takes this medicine. We try and individualize it to you to say, okay, you need to take this, but you need to take something different based on your makeup. Like I said, this is this is where investments are going. I mean, there's a huge sum of money. In 2014, $4.1 billion was invested in digital medicine. And during that time frame, more people were investing in digital medicine than they were in traditional healthcare technology. And I think that will continue to increase. But why do we care about digital medicine? Because it's going to help us treat chronic disease. So there's 100, what is it, 117 million people in the country with chronic disease. And if our population was last around 320 million, that's like 40% of the population of people that are dealing with some form of chronic disease. Whether that's hypertension, whether that's diabetes, it's a huge chunk of our population. And we're not doing a good job. 50% of those people were not controlling the disease process right with our traditional medical therapies. And we find a lot of time, people don't take their meds. It's not fun taking meds. No one likes to take meds. And we're not doing a good job of getting people on the right medications to reduce the complications of that chronic disease. So that's where Proteus Discover comes in. We're taking the technology which is advanced and we're taking healthcare and we're fusing the two to make you empowered as a patient so we can reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with this chronic disease. Well, how does it work? Actually, I'm going to pass this around because I brought a sample kit from my office. And I'll let you guys sort of send it around. So it's, it's fascinating technology to me. So the, main, the first thing you do is you take a medication which has a chip in it. It is about the size of a grain of sand, and it's made sort of, min of minerals you find in copper and magnesium. So we have a series of medications that have these chips in them. And you take the medicine like you're supposed to, like you're prescribed, and it records when you ingest the medication and when it hits your stomach, because the acid, when it hits the, the, the pill with the sensor, sends a signal to a patch that you wear on your stomach. Small wearable patch right there. And you'll see when it passes around, the patch is right there. And all of these are safe and been evaluated by the FDA. Well, what happens when, you, when it hits the patch? So you, you take the pill, you go in to see your doctor, he says, listen, you got high blood pressure, I'm gonna put you on this medication. You get the medicine which has the little sensor in it. You go home, you take the medicine, it hits your stomach acid, sends the signal to the patch. It's then transmitted to an iPad. Which so the iPad records, okay, this is when you took the medication. And then the iPad will automatically upload the information to a server, which then transmits it to a portal that I have in my office where I can remotely monitor it. And this is what you get. So you guys, when you have your app on the iPhone, you're getting when your medications are meant to be, your list of medicines, when they're meant to be taken, if you miss them, if you don't miss them. <coughs> You get to put in your activity, so it automatically records how many steps you're doing. So I can get an idea to say, hey, listen, you got to pick up your activity. You're not doing enough, and if you pick up your activity, that may help reduce your medications and your cholesterol needs. It records your rest, so it knows when you're sort of what position you're in, and records your sleeping patterns, which they've used for people who are, who are depressed. So sometimes they can see, gosh, you know, you're sleeping a lot. Maybe these depression medicines aren't working for you. 
Um, you can input your blood pressure. So in this device, you can, you can take your medicine, you say, 8 o'clock, I took my medicine, here's what my blood pressure was, and you input that, and then I can monitor that remotely. Um, and then you, you can put in your weight, okay? So you can see, okay, you know, my weight's coming down, my blood pressure is this. It allows you to be involved and input all this information in, so it's not just me saying, take this pill, come back and see me in six weeks, we'll see if it's working. Because that, that really isn't working. We know that isn't working. And then again, as a physician, I have this cold portal. So I can spy on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's kind of a smirk, huh? So, so here's what you guys see as a patient. I'm sorry for the small screen, it's kind of hard to see, but you, know, you open this app that's on your iPad, and here's all of your information. It tells you if your sensor's working. It asks you if you've missed any meds. Up here, it tells you, okay, here's the medicines you're supposed to be taking. You're taking 20 milligrams of bisinopril, 5 milligrams of amlodipine, and 20 milligrams of atorvastatin. Here's when you're supposed to take it. It gives a dot if it registered, you took it, and it will give a blank one if you didn't take it, and that's something I need to look at. It tells you, here's your activity. Okay, you've done 3,562 steps, but we're supposed to be getting to 10,000. We gotta pick up our activity level to get there. Again, second page, it tells me when you took your medicines, how many steps you got going, and it tells me how much time you're resting, uh, too, which can be important, important for certain disease states. And then this is what I get to see as a physician. So I pull up this portal in my office, and then I can thumb through and say, oh, patient X has got a 20% adherence rate. I better call them and see what's going on. Or I better bring them into the office because they're not taking their medications. What's the problem? And sometimes, I would never know this. I mean, you may come into the office, I see, well, I see some people every three months, some people every six months, and say, oh, look, your blood pressure looks okay, and off you go. And in this way, I have, I have all this information that I can gather now to make sure we're treating you appropriately. So let's look at a case example. Let's, let's see how this works. So this is a case example, just, just call the patient name. And it's a 73-year-old woman with chronic disease. She's got high blood pressure, she has type 2 diabetes, she's got high cholesterol, and she's depressed. And she's having a hard time taking medications. A lot of people do. I mean, you get depressed when you look in your pill box and you've got 15 pills to take for this chronic disease. And she wants help. So her provider says, hey, look at this technology we have. Let me utilize this technology to see if we can help you become compliant with your medications. And the patient's excited. They want to be, patients want to be involved in their health care. No one likes being lectured and told what to do when they don't understand it. They want to be involved. So she gets involved in this. She registers with the Proteus Discover for medications. They pick three medications off the panel, the ones that she needs, and starts to administer. And everything's going good, but then, but then she calls the doctor and says, hey, listen, I'm feeling a little lightheaded. And if someone comes into me and says, hey, I'm feeling lightheaded, well, well, what does that mean? Does it mean that they have occlusion in their carotid arteries? Are they having problems with blood flow to their heart? Are they having valvular heart disease? Are they having intermittent heart rhythm disorders? And that sometimes you know, involves all this testing so we can figure out what the root cause of this is. But let's look at her profile that came out. So I get the information back and pull it up. I can see, well, she's taking all of her meds. Okay, so she's compliant, taking her medications, it tells me. She's taking the hydrochlorothiazide, the water pill, 90% of the time. She's taking her other blood pressure medicine, the Losartan, 90% of the time. Pretty good about taking the metformin, 50%, or metformin, 81% of the time. It tells me that she's pretty good at taking the medicines when she's supposed to. So sometimes you always wonder, is someone lightheaded because they're throwing all their medicines into one pile and swallowing them at nine o'clock at night, and maybe that's too much for them. But now I know, they're being administered properly. She's taking them as she's supposed to with pretty good compliance rates. Probably not active as much as she should, but getting 30 minutes a day, so we'll take that. The sleep patterns are normal. Her heart rate's normal. Her average heart rate's normal, so it's not that she has too slow a heart rate that's making her dizzy. But then I can pull up her blood pressure logs, and lo and behold, she has, high, she has low blood pressures. So she's getting blood pressures down 99 over 58. So that clues me in as a doctor, well, she's taking her meds like she's supposed to, at the right time, she's doing the activities she'd like to, I'm probably over-medicating her. And I can pull that information out, and I can see, let's back down on your hydrochlorothiazide to see if the symptoms go away. And I may never have known that. 
Because what if she came into the office and was 115 over 80? I'd say, God, your blood pressure looks good. I don't, I don't think it's your medicines that's causing that. But because we have this data, it allows me to treat it. So the lightheadedness goes away. And with the lightheadedness going away, her symptoms go away. And then I don't have to worry about her getting lightheaded, hypotensive, and falling and sustaining some other type of injury. And by bringing the patient in, so getting her on this, you took someone who was hypertensive, didn't want to take their meds, was depressed, and putting them on this Proteus Discover, where you've involved them in their health care, look what you've been able to do. You've taken an initial blood pressure from 169 over 85, four weeks later down to 116 over 76. Much better. Reducing the mortality and morbidity from the chronic disease. You, got, you lost four pounds, and four pounds is four pounds, I and mean, that's good. You got her activity up, so she can, she can log in and say, look, I'm supposed to get a half hour activity a day, I'm doing it, I'm getting my steps, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I'm, and I'm losing weight. You get her cholesterol better, so you can't really see back there, but her total cholesterol goes from 200 to 193, which is good. Lower cholesterol, better. So a perfect example of someone who was not, it wasn't working, the system wasn't working, wasn't able to take the meds, felt depressed, involving them with the digital medicine using the Proteus Discover, and look at the remarkable outcomes you get for weeks later. And this is just one person. I don't know how many, I think we've enrolled over 300 patients at Barton so far with this technology. Uh, yeah. yeah. How does the information get um, into the iPad as far as like the blood pressure and uh, it's, I think it's manual. I think they have to enter it manually. Now I think there is a, a wireless, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a wireless blood pressure cuff that can sink into the iPad. But I think so far people are doing it with manual entry, with weight and blood pressure. Which is important, so I will tell people, if you're going to do that, one of my pet peeves is blood pressure cuffs, because they are notoriously inaccurate, particularly the wrist ones. So all of my patients, whenever they buy a blood pressure cuff, where you get CVS, whatever, I always have them bring it into the office, and we check their blood pressure with the cuff against the manual recording on the wall to make sure that they're accurate. Because a lot of this, and they know how to use it. I mean, you gotta learn how to use a cuff. If it's too loose, it falsely lowers your blood pressure. If you ratchet it on your arm, it falsely elevates it. So some of that does involve some education in the office obtaining that data so we can know that it's accurate. All right, I got one more thing to talk about because this was a personal request, um, and it had to do with uh, shoveling snow, which we've had to do a fair amount of this year. And, and, and how it got on the East Coast especially. Uh, and how that can hurt your heart, okay? And it was really interesting, so I started looking into this. I had a pretty good idea of what, what was going on, so like, I better look into it a little bit. And I didn't know that there were 11,000 ER visits a year for snow shoveling incidents, of which the vast majority are orthopedic, and I can really believe that after I feel my back shoveling. So about 7% of those are heart attacks, however. So 7% of those 11,000 people come in because of heart attacks related to shoveling snow. Well, how can that hurt people? Well, it's hard work. And it's, and so when you're lifting and you're shoveling this heavy Sierra cement, what happens is your heart rate and your blood pressure go up in response to the exercise. And you're in cold air. And that cold air constricts all of your blood vessels. So now you're increasing your heart rate, you're increasing your blood pressure, you're increasing your cardiac output, and you're starving your heart of oxygen. And that, and that constriction can lead to low blood flow to the heart muscle through your coronary arteries, particularly if you already have disease. So here were sort of the recommendations that the American Heart Association has. I couldn't believe they had it, but in response to <laughs> shoveling snow. Number one, take free, I should say the first thing is, if you have bad cardiovascular disease, hire someone else to shovel your snow. Don't do it. It's just not worth it. Okay? But if, if you're gonna do it, you gotta take a lot of breaks. Okay, so take frequent breaks. Shovel for a few minutes, take a break. Shovel for a few minutes, take a break. Number two, don't eat a big dinner where all the blood has gone to your gut and then jump out and shovel snow because that's a recipe for disaster. Get a smaller shovel. You know, don't try and get the huge shovel, lift a huge slab of snow. Smaller shovels, more shoveling, more breaks. Don't drink any alcohol before you go out because it gives you sort of a false sense of warmth and you can start to suffer the effects of hypothermia. And you gotta listen to your body. If you're out there shoveling snow and you're getting lightheaded, you're getting dizzy, you're getting tightness, pressure, heaviness in your chest, you're feeling short of breath, it's time to stop 
don't shovel any more snow, and come see us and let us check it out. Oh, I don't know if you can see the cartoon. I thought this one funny, so it's been talking to the Tin Man, and they said, you know, if I give you a heart, you'll have to start watching the so, so. so I think that's all I have tonight, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. I, I read an article that suggested an additional problem with social media might be you're working your arms a great deal, but possibly not your legs. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. For the orthopedic injuries, like it's like lifting anything. They tell you to lift with your legs, but it's uh, no one does. Also, uh, you said that the, the digital pills were activated by some acid. But what if you take an acid blocker? Uh, I don't. I think the acid blocker reduces the acid in your stomach, but does not completely eliminate the gastric acid production. And I think, you know, if I'm wrong, I think the sensors would still be activated in that situation. Yes. Was recently diagnosed with WPW. Sure. So um, WPW stands for Wolf Parkinson White. So what that is, it's, it's an electrical abnormality in the heart. So if we, let's see if I can go back to the slide here. So what happens in the electrical system is that your electrical impulse begins up in the top right part of your heart called the sinoatrial node and then travels down pathways to another node called your AV node between your atrium and ventricles, and then down these specialized fibers into the ventricles. What Wolf-Parkinson-White is, or WPW, is that there is an extra piece of tissue which is outside the heart's normal electrical system that allows the electrical impulses to come down into the ventricle, bypassing the AV node. And the way we detect that is on an EKG. We can see that sort of accelerated conduction down to the bottom part of the heart, which produces what we call a delta wave. It's a very characteristic pattern on an EKG. Now, some people can have what's called wolf parkinson white pattern, which is just the EKG abnormality, and the other people can have wolf parkinson white syndrome. And what the, the danger of this extra pathway is, is it can generate a heart rhythm abnormality. So electrical impulses can go down one way and then back up another way using that extra tissue and can cause fast heart rhythm and give symptoms of palpitations. And sometimes, in some people, if they develop the atrial fibrillation with Wolf Parkinson White and we treat it wrong, it can cause cardiac arrest. So when we identify people with that pattern on the EKG, the first thing we want to know is, are they having arrhythmias or not? If they're not having arrhythmias, we say you have a pattern, it's not as big a deal. If they're having arrhythmias, we, we would get it fixed. And they fix it with a procedure called an ablation. Yeah. So they'll go in with a catheter, find where that extra piece of tissue is, make a small linear bit burn mark, and get rid of it. So they won't have a problem. Pretty effective. Yes? Is it Repatha? Repatha, R-E-P-A-T-H-A. All my ears are an expert on Repatha, so I'm sure we have an answer. I was wondering if it's been used in any other countries where there's been a longer term. I don't know. Uh, that's always a good question. It, is, it seems like Europe kind of gets a head start on us in, in using medications and clinical trials before we do because of the stringencies of the FDA. I don't know the answer to that. We have to i got to be honest with you. We have had four patients we've sent it in for. I think we just got our first one approved. It's been a logistical nightmare with insurance companies to get it approved because of the medication and its expense. So, yeah, it's a brand new medicine to us, too. Well, thank you for coming. Have a good night.
upon that away I see through smiling faces So why can't I say for you? Look upon sad memories. I've seen the moons in blue, so why can't I say hello? Wandering out, life passed him by. I've seen what the world can do, so I can't have sad to do. I've seen bad it is, blood upon the bad away. I've seen three smiling faces, so why can't I say it to you? Love is 
is as dry as the bottom. Nothing you can ever say to make that poor boy wanna walk away from a lie that is spent in a bottle. Stranger than fiction, living with addiction. Oh, honey, don't you know that poor boy I ran a gown? Living in a bottle, no matter how much you cuddle, that poor boy is drunk from dust to dawn. Broken heart 